podium and then to sit. And uh, this topic is open for discussion. Maybe, maybe I will start uh, with uh, some uh, retro retroact and background. Uh, when we look to this literature in the adjuvant setting, uh, one problem that emerged is the R1, R1 definition, R1 uh, uh, treatment, uh, maybe personalized treatment. So, and we, we, we know that the, the, the definition is evolving uh, a long time along uh, USA and Europe. Uh, and uh, should is it not time to uh, to design a specific trial uh, including only a one uh, a one patient with a good definition maybe personalized uh, adjuvant therapy for this uh, type of uh, patient according to a one uh, type of uh, involvement uh, millimeter of involvement and maybe to show that adjuvant chemo radiation uh, beside uh, good chemotherapy, maybe it's useful. John and so you, you would like to to do again the last ARTC uh, FFCD Jacquard trial, but for one patients. Uh, probably uh, such kind of uh, trial yeah. uh, because in the uh, the new RTOG. Uh, probably the definition of, of R1 it's, uh, should be standardized, but we mm. include both R0 and R1. Mm. So the story is uh, uh, always repeated, and uh, I think that we have uh, personalized therapy based on a, a good definition, not mm. only of surgery, but also of pathological kind. Um, I think what I would like to do is to get um, the R0 and R1 tumors uh, deeply analyzed and to see if there are some deep differences between the two and then think about what we might do. I think just I, I would be happy for someone to do a chemo radiation trial focusing on R2 patients, sorry, on R1 patients. Um, but I'm not sure. I'm not sure with what we've seen so far with chemo radiation in pancreas cancer that that would be a good thing. I don't know. But I think we need a better understanding of what what R zero and R one is. It's not a function of size. We know this. It's not a function of grade. So R zero R one is not necessarily. It's not. It's, it. There's something about a tumor that makes it make because. Sorry. If we just go back to what a pancreas cancer looks like under the microscope, it's not a lump of cancer. You can have your cancer here, your margin is here, and you've got three cells here. And that would automate, automatically make it an R1. It's not cancer that's extended out like that. That's an R2. So there is a different behavior probably between an R0 and an R1 that we're capturing by looking at that specimen under the microscope. So I think a better understanding of what that difference is may then guide us to, you know, to think about the approaches that we should be taking. Where are the site of recurrence in SPAC3 study? Do you have some idea about that? I don't. Do we have what? Sorry. The the site of recurrence in the SPAC3 study. Yeah, we're just analysing all of that. Yeah. So we're also we're also looking at all the margins. So from SPAC1 and R3 we've got seven different margins and we've got all the different lymph nodes. So that's, that's in the computer at the moment and we're just going to start pressing some buttons. So to see if there's anything there. And at the same time, we, we could hypothesize that if we have R1 margins, we, have, we still have some cancer cells uh, in the patients, in the, in the um, operative field. And uh, radiation therapy is a local treatment as surgery. So perhaps these patients could benefit from another uh, local treatment, but obviously after at least six cycles of adjuvant chemotherapy because the first um, danger for these patients is the metastatic disease. And very often they have micrometastatic disease. So first, 
six months of chemotherapy, and then why not for R1 patients, randomize them between uh, observation and chemo radiation with a stratification between R N0 and N plus patients. Because I think N plus patients probably they have micrometastatic disease and uh, chemo radiation won't be useful for them. But Fl Florence, you showed us in the LAPO7 trial, which is still not published, by the way, or have I missed it, um, that if you give radiotherapy, you get more metastases. But you have less local recurrence. No, but you have more metastases. Mm. Yeah, but it, it's in, in terms of percentage, it's not in uh, absolute value. I completely agree with the fact that the tumor in pancreatic cancer is uh, usually more dispersed than in rectal cancer. Caroline Verbeck published a nice paper in histopathology some years ago about this problem. So um, we, we observed in the, in the prospective French study some patient with a wide margin uh, from the SMR to the tumor and some cells in the high part of the retroportal lamina. So this is our one. But my question or my problem is, if you uh, run, it's, it's for my, for my, no, my knowledge, it's, not, uh, it's a question. If you want to randomize on R1 sta status, the problem is that if you have a good pathology, so you randomize quite, quite all the patients. Because if you, if you work with uh, Verbeck or Esposito or Fiona Campbell, or, and, and we show in France that at a, um, a state scale, with good learning for the pathologies, we have 70% R1. Sure. But 80% but of these patients are uh, positive lymph node, with a lymph node ratio more than 0.2. So, uh, what is the, the, the real uh, value of, uh, of R? This is my, my question, sir. I think you sort of answered the question. Um, I mean, one is that actually most patients are R1. We're saying they're, they're not, but most are R1, whether we see it or not. Um, so you then, you've then got to, to think about that, 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 that is it worthwhile giving them chemo radiation? Um, the other thing is, is trying to understand the, the importance of a, of a randomized study. And you can have quality of information, quality of interpretation, quality in terms of the, the extent of the disease. But if you randomize correctly, and that means blinding and standardizing things, you get rid of that. So the first randomized trial in the world ever was, was in Britain, and it was for tuberculosis, and it was single blinded, and it was for streptomycin, and it was in 1947. They finished the trial in two years. And then they didn't know. Every, lots of people were using streptomycin. Lots of people were, were coming to Switzerland to stay in hotels that were very nice and airy and all the rest of it. And that trial bankrupted the, the, the Swiss hotel system because you know, it showed that streptomycin cured people of TB very quickly. So, and you can imagine the variation that you get in TB. But because it was randomized and controlled, you got your answer quickly. I think... So I wouldn't worry about variation, try and minimize variation, but you'll always have variation. It's a bit like the radiotherapist saying, or not radiotherapist, but one or two radiotherapists saying, well, it was the old radiotherapy, but now we've got the new radiotherapy. Well, when you've got the new radiotherapy, it's the old, the present doesn't exist. You have a past and you have a future. You never have the present. So as soon as you have radiotherapy, it becomes old because then there's a new one. So that is not a good argument. So um, you've got to decide whether the existing population is 70% R1, and if it is, you've shown already that radiotherapy doesn't work, okay? 
but we know there's a difference in survival, so there must be a difference in it. So let's try and understand the difference in the biology or the genetics or whatever it is of those two tumor types. Let's do more surgery. More surgery, more tissue. Just to come back to the role of radiotherapy, I, I would agree with you that there might be a role in R1. So why are we not going forward and randomizing patients with R1 into radiotherapy versus whatever? Such an easy and good question. Why are we not doing this? Uh, this can run besides all the other trials that are running and we, we are basing on the Verbecke Esposito classification of R1 and then we randomize into modern radiotherapy, you define, versus, I don't know, adjuvant chemo, something like that. Should be an easy trial and we should be easy, uh, easily getting this done. What do you think? Why don't you take the lead, invite us in Germany and in Britain to uh, do this together with you? With pleasure. I, I would do it. I take it. Uh, yes, but I think that the timing of uh, uh, chemo radiation or radiation of additive radiation should be important mm. and could be uh, could be placed at the end of adjuvant chemo. Yeah, at maybe. the end of the adjuvant. That's the purpose. Not of not the... front uh, chemo radiation. Mm. I don't think so. At the end of six months. Yeah. 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 And, and probably the best benefit is for the N zero patients. Yeah, from for N zero probably patients. Probably yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know, that is, you know, I mean, a, a group that's going well is, is worth supporting even more. Maybe I have a, la a last question for Mark um, about palliative care. When, when should we enroll patients into palliative care? Because in my experience, it's always difficult to talk to them, and when you use the word palliative care, they don't want to listen to you. So, so how do you do that? So as soon as you <coughs> hear the word palliative, um, doctors and patients are really extremely thinking that these patients will die uh, very soon. So, but this is, if you talk about early palliative care or if you talk about cachexia, we always have to keep in mind that even patients who are cachectic, um, at least in our cohort, 50% of these patients who really have severe cachexia, they are on a curative way. So they have a curative to, intention to treat and a curative uh, uh, treatment. And uh, this is the same way when you talk about palliative care. I think you should really include them very early in, in, a, in a program or in a, in a point where you have to to really deal with all the surroundings we have. For sure, we have, in pancreatic cancer, we have surgery at first, we have chemotherapy, maybe radiotherapy, but these are, are, the, are the basis of the treatment. But if you really can have the possibility to improve the condition of the patient, in every treatment, you will get a, a better response of the patient. So as early as possible is my answer. So, sorry, are you telling me that in Munich, every single patient who has pancreas cancer, newly diagnosed, goes to see a psychologist, etc., etc., no, etc. No, not yet, not yet. But every single patient who is diagnosed has a has a screening for nutrition. He he gets the NRS score, and uh, if he has an NRS score of more than three, he gets nutritional intervention. Every single patient. Yeah. Is there good evidence for that? Yes. If you have an NRS score more than three there is evidence for nutritional intervention, and especially in the patients who are being operated. You have a 1A grade of evidence. There are a lot of trials. But Mark, I also have to intervene with, with that statement in, in the following way. In the next ESA meeting uh, in Edinburgh, there is a paper from France that shows that perioperative nutrition after Whipple which is a treatment that is highly liked, obviously, in France, because everybody gets it, is very harmful to the patients. So I like this paper very much. They have many more fistula and very bad outcome 
when you give them nutrition in a way of an enteral nutrition directly after surgery. They have more fistula, more morbidity, more bleeding. I think it is even more mortality. So this was a wonderful thinking that we have to feed our patients. The earlier, the better. But the outcome is the opposite. So I think for this all the nutritional interventions, we also need good studies, no, the studies good randomized are, the trials. Studies, the studies, if, if you uh, start post-operative, I already showed it in our own work, if you have uh, a genial catheter post-operatively in VIPA patients, we showed it in 2001, you have really a, a, a not a better outcome. This, is a retrospect this was a retrospective study, but I did it on my own. And, uh, and what you what you have, you have to be to treat the patients preoperatively. There is the evidence, and there's already the evidence. So postoperative uh, nutritional uh, support, however, is not the evidence. As I said, but if you see the patient before operation, and this is early, and you intervene before the operation, but a lot of people, and even in my department, we really try hard to get it before the operation. This is where we have the evidence. Do, do you give everyone pancreas enzyme replacement therapy after surgery? Pardon? Uh, do you give every, after pancreatic resection, do you give all your patients pancreatic enzyme replacement yes. therapy? All of them? Yes. Because you should put it on your slide. Uh, no, I, I'm, I have it on my slide. It, it was for the question. You can show it on, on the end. Right. Where, where, where we have... And if you have a look at the enzyme supplementation, we are much too less, much too less. So you really should uh, see that, that you have, for one gram of fat, you need 2,500 international uh, uh, enzymes. And if you can, we can I can show it to you. I have, a, have an example, it's just, it's just, just for time is, reason. That is important. It's just for time reason. I didn't show it. And I really uh, assume that everybody in this audience knows it. Right? Well, sorry, the oncologist should give it as well, because... Where, where you've got pancreas Certainly. cancer, you've got blockage of the main pancreatic duct. And, but the problem is most people still do not give it routinely, and it should be given routinely. Yeah, definitely. L last question, maybe? Sorry, it's a question for you, sir. Um, we, we are very interested, interested with sarcopenia, uh, which yeah. is predictive of uh, postoperative failure, etc. I, I know that there is a trial of myostatin, do you know something about this? Yeah, um, I know there's the trial too, but I don't know at the results at the moment. But it's ongoing. Yeah, it's ongoing. And, and we had a work where myostatin really nicely correlates. This is, was experimental work where we showed uh, that the myostatin echohexia is really dropping, but this was for, for the control of, of, uh, of our uh, um, patients. <coughs> this is, myostatin is very interesting, definitely. Okay, thank you. I think it's time to conclude this uh, session. I thank all the speakers for the excellent talk, the discussion, and my co-chair. And so, uh, be tomorrow on time at 9 o'clock, I think. Order announcement from the chair.